Royal birds have got to be some of the strangest birds in the world. They are active mainly at night. They nest in caves, eat fruit, and navigate by echolocation. Their scientific name is Steatornis carapensis, which translates as Fat Bird of Carib. The common name of oil bird comes from the old practice of collecting the fat chicks and then boiling them down to make oil. Their haunting shrieks gave rise to another local name, Diablotine, which is French for little devil. And when you stand in a cave surrounded by hundreds of them, it is easy to understand why. Oil birds are found across the north and northwest of South America, from Guyana to Bolivia. They live in areas where they can access caves or rock gorges for nesting and roosting in the daytime. They are obligate frugivores, meaning they eat only fruit. At night, they search out trees from the Bursaraceae, Luraceae, and Palmae families. Here you can see the huge piles of seeds that accumulate in their caves. A very useful resource for researchers, and also for some animals living in the caves, such as this forest rat. This project started when David Euler, a board member of the Ace Wright Nature Center, got some funding from the Wildlife Conservation Society and Featherlink to purchase six GPS tracking tags, each one of which cost 2,000 US dollars. The project's aim was to find out more about where the oil birds in Trinidad travel during their foraging forays, specifically the ones roosting in Dunstan's Cave, situated within the lands of the Ace Wright Nature Center. In order to better conserve the birds, it is important to find out where they forage and how far they travel. The first task of this project was to capture several birds so we could attach the GPS trackers. It was decided that all six trackers would be put on birds from Dunstan's cave, as it was the easiest cave to access for the repeat visits required to download the data from the trackers. One evening, in mid-November 2015, around 5 o'clock, Two 10 meter long bird nets were attached to a 7 meter high triple net frame placed across the stream at the entrance to Dunstan's cave. We then waited for darkness to fall. As night descended, the oil bird started to stir within the cave, circling around before flying out into the forest. We waited until we heard a bird get caught in the net, which was then pulled down quickly so we could untangle the bird before it hurt itself. Carl Fitzjames, an expert bird bander, removed the birds from the net with some help, then took them to the rest of the team, who weighed the birds, then measured their forewing length to make sure they were fully grown adults, and thus able to support the extra weight of the tracking unit. Each tracker weighed 25 grams, which was around 5% of the bird's body weight. The tracker was attached like a backpack, with one strap around the bird's chest and one around its lower back. The bird was then released to carry on its nighttime foray. Using this method, trackers were attached to four birds on the 14th of November and two more on the 7th of December. The trackers were programmed to take six readings every 24 hours. The batteries were expected to last 12 to 14 months. To collect the data, a special receiver unit was taken into the cave, and if a bird with a tracker was present, the receiver would automatically download all the data. This only took a few seconds, and would work with birds up to 50 meters away. After a few weeks, we had only picked up signals from two of the six birds, so we decided to start visiting the other oil bird cave to see if any of our missing birds had just moved home. There are seven known roosts of oil birds in Trinidad, consisting of five caves in the northern range, one in Cumaca Valley, three in Aripo Valley and one in Arima Valley, and two sea caves, one at Lavash Point and one on Fuevos Island. There were several other historical roosts, but through a combination of quarrying and over-harvesting, these populations have disappeared. The five caves in the northern range were visited several times each throughout 2016 and early 2017. Finding them was not always easy, and the trails are prone to becoming overgrown or very muddy. And you never knew what you were going to encounter. At each cave, we used the receiver unit to try and pick up any signals, and then did a complete count of the birds in the cave. This entailed two people standing together in the centre of a chamber and then counting every bird that was either on a nest or clinging to a ledge. An estimate was then made of the number of flying birds for an overall total. Counts were compared and then repeated until an average was reached. A camcorder with an infrared light was also used to get a permanent record of each cave's oil birds population. Out of the six trackers, we unfortunately only got data back from two of them. BIRD2 returned data from November to December 2015. It mostly kept to the northern range, apart from a couple of trips down past Sangre Grande, 
The furthest distant flown was around 25 kilometers. Bird 1 returned data from November 2015 to August 2016 and was much more wide-ranging. As well as flights down to near the Arena Reservoir and up in Am Manzanilla, it also took a summer break. On the 1st of August 2016, Bird 1 flew almost directly east for 150 kilometers far into the Paria Peninsula in Venezuela. The data showed that it flew 120 kilometers in just four hours. It then stayed in the area until the 20th of August before flying directly back to Dunstan's Cave. In David Snow's 1962 paper on oil birds, he estimated foraging distances by identifying the seeds found in a cave and working out the nearest location where those seeds could be found growing. He thought that 50 kilometers was the furthest distance the birds would travel to forage. Two more recent studies conducted on oil birds in Venezuela showed that they foraged much further. In 1994, Roberto Rocca radio tracked birds and found one travelled about 120 kilometers distance in one night, but not in a straight line. In a 2009 study, Richard Holland et al. used GPS trackers and recorded one bird travelling 75 kilometers from its roosting cave. Our results have doubled this distance and shown that Trinidad's oil birds are truly international. Although the main purpose of this project was to track the birds' movements, it was also a good opportunity to do an update on the overall population in Trinidad. Dunstan's Cave is actually a narrow gorge with a permanent stream flowing through it. This is the most surveyed oil bird population in the country, and over the years counts have varied from 30 to over 200. At the time of this study, the count was 180 birds. A repo main cave is the largest known cave system in Trinidad. It is over 860 meters long. An intermittent stream flows into the cave, and the oil birds occupy the main chamber at the entrance and a smaller chamber deeper inside. The total count was around 480 birds. Carriker's Cave has a wide mouth leading to a narrow tunnel and is about 30 meters long. There is an intermittent stream along the base of the cave which only flows after heavy rain. The total count was 200 birds. Soho Cave consists of a large domed chamber with a smaller chimney or well-like chamber to one side, and the total count was just 90 birds. Kumaka Cave, also known as the Oropuch Cave, consists of three main chambers linked by low passages. It is an outflow cave and a permanent stream runs along the base. The birds, split between the three chambers, total about 1,400 altogether. The hardest population to survey was the almost inaccessible sea cave on Huevos Island. However, on a second attempt, when the seas were calmer and the tide was low, I managed to swim in through the only entrance and count over 200 birds in the dome-shaped cave. Lavash Sea Cave also took two attempts before access was gained. This cave is on the north coast of Trinidad and consists of a large main chamber with a small one further back. Over 450 birds were counted in the cavern. Snow estimated that there were 860 birds in the Northern Range Caves in the late 1950s and early 60s. Our count was the total to around 2,350, which is great news for a species that used to be heavily persecuted. For the sea caves, Snow gave a rough estimate of around 600 altogether, and we found slightly more, but getting an accurate count in the conditions was very tricky. As was seen from the tracking data, birds can spend a significant amount of time outside of the roosting caves. So in order to get a more accurate population count, a long-term census is required. The tracks from the two birds both showed that they range widely both around Trinidad and further afield, but neither bird seemed to visit the other oilbird caves at any point. Do the populations in each cave keep to themselves? Further GPS tracking could answer this question, but a study in progress at the moment is using feathers gathered from the floors of the caves. DNA will be extracted from the feathers, which will then be sequenced and compared to see if there are any indications that populations are interbreeding. There is still much we don't know about this most unusual bird, but with the advances in tracking technology and molecular analysis, many more of our questions will no doubt soon be answered. <laughs>